coming and next Tuesday. Uh, can everyone hear me? Perfect. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of the long-term effects that we can observe in uh, wild populations after we supplement them using captive breeding programs. So there's a number of reasons why an institution might decide to initiate a captive breeding program. One example is for outreach, extension, or conservation education, and this occurs in some um, exhibits you might see at your local zoo. Captive breeding programs can also be used to support harvest activities, which is pretty common in fisheries or in forestry applications. And finally, captive breeding can also be used to support recovery of endangered species. And in these kinds of situations, what usually happens is uh, individuals are collected from the wild, brought into captivity, and then are bred for a number of generations in a way that's meant to limit the effects of drift and adaptation to captivity. And then after some period of time, at least some of these individuals can be used to supplement either existing wild populations or as a source for reintroduction of new uh, populations into the wild. The trouble with this is that we know that adaptation to captivity causes a reduction of fitness in captive-born individuals once they're in the wild. So this plot here is showing the fitness of captive-born individuals relative to wild-born individuals all measured in the wild across six case studies. And the important point here is that for the vast majority of cases, the fitness is less than one, and actually the mean comes out about 0.5, right? So the captive-born individuals have about half the fitness of the wild-born individuals. And this gets compounded because adaptation to captivity can occur in just a few number of generations, and at least some of the time, this fitness reduction is terrible. So what this means for uh, species bred in captivity is that over a relatively few number of generations, we can have uh, a, negative demo or a negative fitness consequence in the wild population. So what we were interested in looking at were um, evaluating some of the long-term effects that result from supplementation practices. And we did this by addressing three questions. The first was to look at how much adaptation to captivity has to occur before we can actually detect an effect on the wild population. Secondly, we were interested in looking at whether or not we could limit some of the effects by changing some of our parameters or some of the ways we um, supplemented the wild population. And then finally, we were interested in looking at whether we could rely on natural selection to kind of mitigate any of these negative effects. So because this is uh, the data required to answer these questions, at least to collect them empirically, would be pretty difficult. We approach this from a modeling perspective. So we designed a forward, uh, forward time agent-based model where each individual in the simulation has genotypes across 50 neutral microsatellite loci. So beginning with the wild population, we controlled reproduction using the logistic growth equation. And then we added density-dependent mortality effects to account for things such as competition. We included density-independent mortality to account for things such as climate variability. We included growth and aging for all the linked individuals in our model. And then finally, we applied a fitness-related mortality event. Now, alongside this wild population, we also included a captive population. And this was initiated by selecting 15% of the wild-born uh, mature individuals each year. And then these individuals were allowed to breed in captivity, and at this point we controlled the rate of reproduction using a ratio between the number of individuals born in the wild that year and the number of individuals that we were going to release from the captive population. And mostly, or what you'll hear today anyway, uh, we kept the, this ratio at one to one. And then we allowed the individuals born in captivity to grow up a little bit, we eliminated the captive parents, and then released these uh, captive-born offspring back into the wild. And importantly, we modeled adaptation to captivity by applying a one-time survival cost to any individual born in captivity. So for example, if we wanted to model the effects of a 10% fitness reduction, assuming the individual born in captivity had both parents um, without any captive ancestry, that individual would have a 10% chance of being removed from the population at this fitness-related mortality event. If we wanted to model the effects of a 50% reduction, then it would have a 50% chance of being removed at that time. So we 
parameterized this model using um, four model species that have been used in captive breeding and release programs. And we chose these to cover a wide variety of life history characteristics. So we use Kobo salmon to represent a species that has a short lifespan, a high fecundity, and kind of counter to that, the golden line tamarind, which also has a short lifespan, but a lower fecundity. We use western toads to represent kind of a moderate lifespan with high fecundity, and finally, a whooping crane, which has a really long lifespan, but a lower fecundity. So to quantify the effects of supplementation, we use two parameters, the first of which was population size. So this plot here is showing 100 replicates of a supplemented coho salmon population, and that's overlaid on top of uh, 100 replicates of the control unsupplemented coho salmon population. So to calculate uh, the effect of supplementation in this example, we looked 100 years after the end of captive breeding and compared the population size in the supplemented population, which is around 150 in this example, to the control which was about 500. So we'd say for this set of parameters, supplementation resulted in a 70% demographic reduction. And we applied a similar approach when we were looking at the effects on genetic diversity. So we compared the number of alleles in the supplemented population to the unsupplemented population across all 50 neutral microsatellite loci. So again, looking 100 years after supplementation ended, we consider the effects of adaptation to captivity, here again modeled as a direct fitness cost. What we found is that we had a disproportionately high uh, demographic reduction resulting from these fitness reductions. So for example, if we had a 10% reduction in the western toad, this led to a 40% decrease in population size. And this was a result of uh, individuals with captive ancestry sneaking into our captive breeding program pulling the fitness down uh, year after year. And if we also consider the effects of genetic diversity, uh, again, 100 years after supplementation, you can see that in both of these, uh, er, in terms of both population size and neutral genetic diversity, these effects scaled with lifespan of the species we were considering. So what I mean by this is that our example of a long lived species, whooping crane, had, had a diminished effect uh, relative to these shorter lived coho salmon and golden lion salmon. So, by changing some of our parameters, such as how many offspring we release from captivity or carrying capacity, or even considering reintroduction programs as opposed to these um, more strict supplementation ones, we could cause these lines to shift a bit, but in general, they told the same story. So, Overall, what we got from this is that even moderate amounts of adaptation to captivity can have these long-lasting effects. So next, we were interested in looking at how can we kind of reduce some of these effects um, by changing some of the ways that the supplementation program worked in our model. So we started by looking at um, the duration of supplementation. So again, this is population size uh, with, of uh, coho salmon populations where we supplemented for 50, 25, and 10 years. And the point here being that if we did decrease the duration of supplementation, we could limit the effects on the, uh, on the wild population. And when we looked across all the four species that we modeled, we found a negative and fairly linear relationship between the number of years of supplementation and the demographic reduction observed between the supplemented and the unsupplemented populations. And I think this is promising. It shows that we can kind of pull back and, and reduce what negative effects on the wild population we might otherwise expect. Um, the trouble is that I'm not sure if supplementing for one, two, or, or even 10 years would hit any of the um, goals of the species recovery plan. So we also considered the effects of removing or of limiting the <coughs> ancestry within the individuals that we allowed to breed in captivity. And so when we did this, we found that it didn't matter how long we supplemented, we saw a reduced effect on population size relative to the control, but that this was much less than um, when we hadn't eliminated captive ancestry from the breeding program. But, and I think this could be an effective approach, obviously, but one of the limitations would be in trying to get this going. I think it would require either 
a pedigree wild population or significant genetic resources that would allow you to determine the captive ancestry of the individual you collected prior to reproduction. So finally, we wanted to look at the effects of natural selection and see if that could act to kind of rebound these wild populations. And so we did this by preferentially choosing individuals with higher than average fitness. So this plot shows um, the distribution of relative fitness for uh, the wild population at time t in black. And you can see that if we selected only some of the most fit individuals, we can shift the relative fitness up uh, towards the purple histogram in the following year. And so what we found when we did this was that even under low selection intensity, we got a uh, partial rebound of population size. And when we increased selection intensity, we could fully recover population size of the supplemented population relative to where we would expect to make the control. Unfortunately, this had a kind of negative re uh, relationship with the neutral genetic diversity contained in these populations. And this relationship scaled with selection intensity. And this is just a result of continually selecting individuals from the same family lines that were more fit than the others. So overall, we found that even at modest fitness reduction, um, or even modest fitness reductions as low as 1% resulted in decreased population size and neutral genetic diversity uh, relative in the supplemented population relative to the unsupplemented population. However, we found that we can control this uh, reduction by limiting either the duration or the captive ancestry contained within the captive breeders, and that would uh, at least partially recover some of the uh, population size and neutral diversity. And finally, we found that natural selection will lead to a demographic recovery, but the cost of this is a decline in neutral genetic diversity. So with that, I'll just give a quick shout out to these humans who helped me prepare. And I think I have about two minutes for questions.